Whoa, that's what's keeping you in the air if and your pilots aren't on top of it. <clears throat> kind of gets you right in the feels. Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop today. A treat as best y'all come by way of friends in low places. A scrap bin adjacent to a C-130J Lockheed Hercules Super, I think, no, a Super Herc. Now this is an angle of attack sensor. The same type of angle of attack sensor, what caused uh, all the problemos on that Boeing 737 MAX. Witness now the power of the internet. I don't know, I'll just move these aside. Shill, I will say one thing. If your welds sound like bacon, you're doing just fine. If they smell like bacon, partner, you're on fire. Now, th this thing is power. Witness to the power of the internet. You put a half dozen million keys into a fishbowl you get rooting around eventually you get the keys to a porch 911 there's a lot of fucking brainiacs what uh come down here and put your countenance in the doobly to one of those brainiacs just so had access to uh itac approved uh well this is scrap it's a scrap angle of attack sensor so uh yeah fully compliant i don't have any of the schematics of course because they're military grade schematics not allowed to have that sort of thing so uh i just like to say i, I love you fucking guys You're taking care of my uh, commercial interests abroad uh, protecting them from those fuckers in the mud huts thank you very much i yeah uh, I, I, I i yeah please don't nuke me this came out of a scrap bin now, this kind of instrumentation, you got to love it because this thing is built like a shit brick house. It's just no expense spared. It's not even, it's make believe money, essentially. They, these guys have been around for, since Christ was a cowboy, Rosemount Aerospace, probably owned by some big bastard of, a, of an outfit now. It's an angle of attack sensor, as I said. Now, look at this. You would think maybe this had a potentiometer in it, but. As uh, as the fellow what sent this to me indicates, there's dead spots and potentiometers, and yeah, you can back check the. But this does angle sensing. Look at the G's-less pins on that. What thirty pin there about? Something like that. Anyway, big big old cannon plug on her. Another clue that this is good. Pinned, and then a diamond pin. You don't see that diamond pin very often. It's got to be just so to get in there also if you feel the mechanism it's beautiful smooth no jankiness at all and the stop is a hard stop you can hammer on that nothing will happen to her everything's just i mean so what do you think surrender monkey units or freedom units i mean oh, look at this look at this they've even plugged up the fasteners with silicon carney boing that's probably, probably got a part number on that on that little silicon plug too only cost you about 800 bucks but it does come with certification you gotta have that trail of tears there in case something happens i mean this thing how many tons of steel and uh, aluminium and fuel is flying around in the air in the air it's got to be fucking skookum so i was very naive in my assessment of the boeing situation i i neglected the dehumanizing effect of the modern corporation as well i figured that the faa the federal era you know the the federal AA um, was more than just a rubber stamp for Boeing. Apparently, I was mistaken. So this thing, just beautiful. Look at this. Got a big diaphragm sealing out the elements. Got two wire. Got four wires going in there into two pegs. Double redundancy, belt and suspenders. That's that's aerospace, man. So what that would have to be is some sort of heater. Now the heater in an airplane, of course, is 400 hertz ac hurts so good and i think it's uh 115 volts but 400 hertz also some of the systems run on 26 volts dc and there's also some low voltage ac in there all sorts of electronical stuff going on but we see just for de-icing purposes of course if you get ice on this 
that changes the contour that would uh, throw off your hangulation. Okay, so getting into the bowing problem. First, let's talk about the technical, very cursorily, the technical one. We discussed it, and there was lots of comments in the doobly-doo, and we sort of narrowed down on what was going on. So what we do know is the pilot the youngest pilot in Ethiopian history to, to be the captain of a 737 MAX, 29 years old, had 8,000 flying hours. It seems a little, that's a lot, that's very high for such a young man. The co-pilot only had 200 flight hours and the uh, engineer on board, of course, non-existent. I didn't know that. They got rid of uh, flight engineers apparently a long time ago when they replaced them with confusers. <laughs> Who knew? Uh, you know, I thought I was an expert by watching the airplane movie. Apparently, that does not make you an expert unless you're flying for... Never mind. Never mind. Uh, the So, okay. So here's Boeing. They have a super successful uh, airframe in the 737, been sold all over the world, rock solid, airframes probably 50, 60 years old. Airbus comes out with a better unit that serves, serves the same, it's the same tool, but it's 15% more efficient. So Boeing sales of that particular plane plummet. The secret is Airbus has a better engine. It's bigger, it's more efficient. Thing is, the airframe for the 737 won't fit that. Some brainiac or some somebody at Boeing fingers out, aha, what we can do to mount those big old Royce, Rolls-Royce engines is we can mount them further forward of the wing, underneath the wing, and prop them up a little bit. Now, these are great big hunks of gravity, and that changes the balance of the airframe itself. Now, they do not want to create a new airframe because if they do, they need to certify that new airframe with the FAA. So here's where the rubber snap comes in. They say, listen, we're just taking the old airframe and we're putting on upgraded engines. No big deal. Well, they found out that the upgraded engines causes that if, if it's just uh, kind of idling along, or no, if it's at full thrust, rather, it causes the nose to pitch up on the plane. And the nose pitching up on its own can create a situation where there's stall over the wing. So stall, basically it creates very little lift. You, your lift drops off, you stall, and then you plummet out of the sky. Not good for a commercial airplane. So what Boeing did was um, they put in a piece of software, uh, which was not autopilot. It is essentially on... Uh, it's active, as far as I know, all the time, so that if you pitch up too far, if this angle of attack sensor tells the plane that it's pitching up too far, it noses down. Now, you're sitting in the pilot seat, and your plane all of a sudden noses down because you got an erroneous reading. You shit your fucking pants, and you ain't got much time to, to figure out what was going on so the airlines now everybody's complicit in this unfortunately now the airlines don't want to train their pilots because that costs money everything costs money fuel you know these this plane costs eight grand an hour to run this uh max not the herc i don't know how much that costs probably more because it's military but it costs eight thousand dollars uh, an hour to run. Now, how much does it cost to train a pilot in this MCAD system? So now on the Lockheed C-130J, the Super Herc, there is not one, not two, not four. There's four angle of attack sensors all feeding into the central confuser in order to give you the angle of the dangle. If one of those is erroneous, two of them are, you're still not going to fall out of the sky. On the Boeing... Here, what fell out of the sky for the Indonesia flight as well as the Ethiopia flight, but one. Uh, now, I'm not privy to safety and design considerations within Boeing. Uh, rest assured, there is a committee what looks at this sort of thing and how they decided that the single uh, angle of attack sensor was okay, uh, along with this little piece of secret software that no one was really all that aware of. I'm sure there was a bulletin after the fact. You can, if 
Oh, of course, this is a discussion. If I'm mistaken, please correct me down in the doobly-doo. And there will be a errata, of course, as uh, mistakes come to the fore from this discussion. However, you look at the modern corporation, okay? What is the modern corporation good at? First of all, what is a modern corporation? It's essentially a citizen without voting rights. So it's a golem, what we have created without ethics or morality and it, all its purpose is and it's very very good at it is making profit so people say to me you know ai is going to uh, take all our jobs and it's gonna it's going to totally disrupt our society well partner we already have ai we have uh, we all work for golems for corporations wherein we get dehumanized, we essentially are cogs in the wheel of this corporation, and we see the dehumanizing effects of strictly profit motives here. They want to supply the least amount of service for the maximum profit. As human beings, we are governed more or less by our ethics and morality, some less than more, but we set up institutions to protect us from the horrible and terrifying efficiency of corporations. Corporations, their only mandate is to make money, and that doesn't jive with humans surviving and living. So we need an intermediary to protect us, and that, in a lot of cases, is uh, instituted by the federal government. In some, in some cases, it's the provincial government, but provinces or states are too small. Like Boeing would just walk all over them because they're so powerful. Again, they're essentially citizens what cannot vote. However, they vote with their wallet. And a right holy terror it is to be able to vote with a wallet what's got billions of disposable dollar dues. The, the problem, of course, is, is the dehumanizing effect of having your, losing your job. You know, listen, we're doing it this way. And don't fucking speak up because your $160,000 a year job, what supports your family in Seattle, gone. Also, your wife, what needs the pills, now your Medicaid gone uh you're down the road listen do as you're told and shut the fuck up and we're putting one <laughs> angle of attack sensor on here and the other problem of course is with the feds the faa just rubber stamped it essentially oh you only want the one sensor on there uh you know okay well you're the expert i guess uh you provide the data that there are very few failures of these things and uh ka-chunk ka-chunk there you go thank you very much we'll see you next election that's my little rant anyway. I think this guy's some kind of fucking communist. No, it's, it's not that. I, You know, you got to let the cream rise to the top. And uh, it, it's, it's just if you let a sociopath run the show, sh bad shit happens. And you need systems in place to prevent a sociopath from making decisions what kill a whole bunch of people. So... I maybe uh, got enough experience in my life to, to to know that you don't let the fox guard the hen house. Ah, we're in like saying, you ready for this? This is uh, what's the only thing is separating you from a bad day. Well, you're already in a plane. You're having a bad day from having a really bad day. Bit of pucker factor here. Two little sensors. Some angel hair pasta. That's... Uh, <laughs> Not confidence inspiring. And that's not even two sensors. That is some sort of dash pot. Look at that. So that is some sort of rotary uh, shock to uh, keep that from jittering around. There's the mechanical stop there. Beautiful piece of anodized aluminum. And ka-chunk, ka-chunk. Hits right up against there. This would be a resolver of some sort. Not an encoder. It's uh, an encoder doesn't have the resolution you want, and this doesn't have any dead spots at all because it would be well, a resolver is essentially a, a motor, and depending on where you put the armature, uh, it outputs a different voltage. So, by the look of it, here we got one, two, six wires, three phase. Let's see, I bet you three phase. Oh, okay. On the stator, which is the field windings around the periphery, 
11 volts, and that would be AC. It would have to be AC, and it's three phase, and we feed that 11 volts, and then on the output, no, this would be the input, and then on the rotor itself, it's 26 volts AC. So we must energize the spinny bit, and then we read off what kind of voltage we're getting out of the three phases of the field, and correlate that to, in a lookup table, to the angle of the dangle. This is it. That's, <laughs> whoa, that's what's keeping you in the air if and your pilots aren't on top of it. <clears throat> kind of gets you right in the feels. So we'll get the back end of her off, see what other secrets lie within. I generally prefer my enigmas wrapped in mystery, covered in schmoo, but aerospace. I don't think there's all that much schmoo to go around. And of course the fasteners are freedom units. And uh, here we have the ubiquitous 608 skateboard bearing. No markings at all on her other than the shielding MPB. That's quite surprising that they wouldn't have uh, name brand bearings. It's smart that they're using skateboard bearings though. Fuck me running. Right the fuck away from Boeing planes. <laughs> As a professional courtesy, I refer you to the addendum to the dedendum of the NASA report on the Challenger disaster, what killed uh, that nice school teacher, uh, the fact that every engineer in the place thought that 50% uh, wear on an O-ring was still sealing and perfect, when any monkey off the fucking street can tell you that 50% uh, left in an O-ring is no fucking good at all. This is that. This is that. One of the Jesus things. Come on. How much does this fucking thing cost? Certainly not 300 fucking lives. Jesus. It make it give you a fucking head a shake, eh? In the comfort of his own empire dirt. What the fuck do I know? And now this is obviously off a different plane and so forth, but they don't, you know, they don't reinvent the wheel every time they want to make a new angle of attack sensor. So this is the sensing element itself. We can see it. Uh, it's not filling me with a whole lot of confidence. I could see why Lockheed puts four of these on here. Those are the brushes there. And that's not helping you at all, is it? Okay. That's what gets power into the rotor. The single phase into the rotor. It's just a couple of little antennae, bug ears, and the back end keeps the rotor in position. And then just some wraps of, looks like gold wire. And that's, uh, yeah, that's how she do. And then the, each phase, of course, around the periphery of the stator. That is what is, uh, wow, wow. So this angle of attack center, this single one, not a whole lot of redundancy in the sensing element itself. A very keen attention to detail in the build quality. And, of course, keeping out the elements. And overall, skookumness is... Well, overall, I mean, I couldn't even get the Jesus um, gearing off. She was on there so tight. I mean, tight fitments, everything. Right, solid. But, man, oh, man, I don't know what you'd be thinking to to fool yourself into believing that just one no redundancy is perfectly okay i don't under i don't understand it myself maybe i'm missing something if and you would uh we will revisit this i'm gonna try and get a, a, an actual boeing uh angle of attack sensor and we'll go through that maybe it's completely different maybe it's far more skookum with built-in redundancies at the same time though there's still only the one mechanism it just needs to get plinked or freeze up or seize up or get some schmoo in there and then it's ORF. Scary stuff. So thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice.